Namaste, everybody. Thank you, Milind, for inviting me to your yoga group for speaking about yoga and how it is relevant in today's life. So most of you here have heard about yoga. Okay? What is the first thing in Patanjali Yoga Sutra? The Patanjali Muni is credited with compiling all the yogic knowledge from the past and systematically writing down what we call the Yoga Sutra. So Yoga Sutra is credited to Patanjali Muni. So Patanjali Muni is our guru who has systematically put everything together into Yoga Sutra for us to understand what yoga means. Yoga is actually a darshan. It's one of the six major darshan shastra or schools of thought. Okay. So the first darshan shastra is Sankhya, the first school of thought. Sankhya by Kapila Muni. So Kapila Muni is the first philosopher in the world. He is the one who thought about life in a deep, deep manner and tried to explain that to us. So he explained to us that there is something called Prakriti, which is what we see around us. All the world around us is called Prakriti. Whatever is observed, whatever we observe as apart from us, that is Prakriti. And the one who is experiencing it, the one who is observing it is called Purusha. This is the major crux of what is called Sankhya Darshan. Sankhya, the word Sankhya comes from Sankhya. So it is, as you would guess, quantitative. It quanti quantifies everything. All right. So Kapil Muni told us about Sankhya Shastra, in which there is a Purusha who is the experiencer. He is the fundamental reality. And Prakriti, the observed, it is the world around us. So Prakriti and Purusha, these are two fundamental entities. They exist eternally. And when they come together, then experience happens. We all know that. No problem. Okay. Here, there is no mention of God yet. Okay. But the people who started thinking deeply about it, they understood that whatever is in the world gets created because they created things. You know, we create things, we put things together and something gets created. So we think that this world around us, this exists. I also exist. I'm observing the world. So I think that this world must be created by somebody. So who is that? That must be some superhuman being who has created this world. And man started calling that superhuman being as God. The one who creates the world, who operates the world, who maintains the world. That started being called God. So that God comes in the second darshan. That is yoga darshan. So yoga darshan systematically written down by Patanjali Muni. In this, there is a word called Ishwara Pranidhana. That Ishwara Pranidhana mentions Ishwara. That Ishwara is what we call God. In theistic religions, the omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient entity is called God. In Sanatan Vedic Dharma, this God can be Saguna Sakar. That Saguna Sakar means the one with attributes and the one with shape. Saguna means with guna, with attributes, and Sa Akar means with a shape. So somebody who is with attributes and shape is called the Saguna Sakar Ishwara. And that can manifest itself in many different ways. So in our case, we can have our own Ishta Devata. We can choose which God we want to worship or which form we want to worship. God is one, by the way. Okay. And all these manifestations are called deities. So we can think of God in a manner that suits us. That is called Ishta Devata. Therefore, there is no reason for us to condemn anybody because they worship this God or they worship that God. There are no many gods. God is one. God is that entity which creates this universe, 
sustains this universe and in whom the entire universe dissolves. These three aspects of God are called Brahma, Vishnu and Mahesh. This is the Trinity. This is the Holy Trinity that Hindus worship. These are not three different gods. These are three different functional aspects of the same God. God is not many. God is one. All right. Now, we come into Yoga Darshan where the concept of God is explained to us. It's a useful concept because whether God exists or not, who has seen God? Has anybody seen God? How does he look? That Saguna Sakar Roop of God, the manifested and the one with attributes, that kind of entity will appear to us the way we imagine it. Okay. So for us, God may be Krishna, God may be Christ, God may be Rama, God may be Ganapati, any God of our choice. God may be Shankara, Shiva. We will see God the way we imagine God. Okay. I'll go a bit further. I will come back to yoga, by the way. I'll take you all the way first and then do a flashback on yoga, how we get there. Think of God or think of anything. Where is that thought appearing? That thought is appearing within me. This is called vritti. Okay. So if we see something, let's say a simple thing like a phone. Okay. I'm seeing the phone. What is actually happening? I'm looking at the phone. I, I think that I'm looking at the phone. But what is actually happening is light is falling on this phone. It is being reflected from the phone. That light is entering my eyes. That light is forming an image on my retina. It's actually an inverted image. Urdhumulam, Adashakam. That's what Bhagwan says in the 15th chapter of the Gita. So, light enters us not the object itself. All right. I say that I'm seeing the phone, but the phone has not entered my eyes. An image is formed in my eyes. That image is transmitted into my vision center through electromagnetic waves, neurosignals. Once a sensation happens in my vision center, I realize that I'm looking at the phone. So what has happened? I have looked at the world the world has created an impression in my eyes, on my retina, and in my mind in terms of electrical impulses. That's what neuroscience will tell us. But unless this whole process happens, I cannot really say that I have seen something. And if I close my eyes, then this disappears. What does this mean? This means that the world appears to us as images in our mind only when our eyes are open and our mind is behind the eyes awake to take in those impulses. That's the way we experience the world through five senses. Through our eyes we see, through our nose we smell, through our tongue we taste, through our ears we hear and through our skin we touch. So we experience the world through our five senses in our mind. So therefore, the mind is also called the sixth Indriya. Manashashthan Indriyani Prakritisthani Karshadi. That's what Bhagavan says in the 15th chapter of the Gita. So the mind as the sixth Indriya takes all the impulses from the five senses, the five gross senses, Shabda, Sparsha, Rupa, Rasagandha, sound, touch, then Shabda, Sparsha, Rupa, eyes, you know, through the eyes, then rasa through the tongue and gandha through the nose. So these are the five experiences we get constantly, continuously, all the time. The experience we are getting right now, what we do is we compare this experience, the current experience with past experiences. Based on that, we interpret the current experience as such. So think of our current experience right now. Our current experience is Vikram Dada is talking to you. That's what you think, isn't it? 
what is happening is you are getting three different kind of kinds of impulses three different kinds of experiences the first experience is through your eyes you are looking at a shape that is called akar or rupa the second experience you are getting is within that shape you are seeing some colors that is called ranga so rupa ranga those two experiences are happening through your eyes into your mind okay the third experience that's happening right now is through your ears some sounds are entering your ears that sound is vibrating your eardrum and then some electromagnetic waves are going into your audio center in that audio center there is a sensation whatever sensation is happening in your audio center you are interpreting that as english language and a discussion about yoga because you have heard english language in the past so you compare these sounds with whatever you have experienced in the past and then you say okay yeah this is english language these are certain words so this is what happens in the whole process okay when we analyze our everyday experience we will realize that we are experiencing only five different sensations shabda sparsha rupa rasa gandha and depending upon our prior experiences we will interpret the current experience as we interpret it what does this mean this means that the world appears to us not the way the world is the world appears to us the way we are okay when we are in a good mood then everything seems wonderful if a boy and a girl are in love okay then suddenly their mood is so good their heart is so full of joy and love that everything appears to be wonderful to them the whole world the entire experience of life is really wonderful when somebody is in love now why do we have to fall in love we don't have to fall in love why cannot why can we not be in love at all times with everybody without any expectations in return and our experience of life can be wonderful can be beautiful right when does this happen this happens when our mind is joyful serene peaceful without any desires without any expectations that's when we are really joyful see why do we do things why do we do anything in life we do things because we want to be happy why are we sitting in this lecture we want to be happy if you are not happy while listening to the lecture you have the choice to turn this whole thing off and do something else that will make you more happy absolutely right so we do anything and everything to be happy so if you want to turn this thing off you will turn this thing off because you want to be happy because being here is making you unhappy so we do anything or we avoid something only to be happy when we do something to be happy it's called pravrutti and when we avoid something to be happy then it is called nivrutti both pravrutti and nivrutti are necessary in life we should know what to hold on to for how long and when to give it up so when to engage in pravrutti and when to disengage when we go into nivrutti both of these things are necessary we should understand that okay going back to our yoga patanjali muni the very first verse the first sutra yoga sutra is called atha yoga anushasanam atha means and now and now means what we have done all kinds of things we have done many things we have done many pravruttis and nivruttis but we haven't really found what we wanted to find what we found was basically misery 
initially when we were doing something it was quite joyful it was very enjoyable but then after some time the same thing became miserable so what i was thinking was giving me joy was actually a cause of sorrow if i kept on pursuing it think of our daily example of eating see right now i am hungry i am healthy great food is available in front of me when i eat i feel awesome okay i love mangoes we have two boxes of mangoes upstairs so when i eat a mango i feel great how many mangoes can i eat at one time if i eat the first mango i feel wonderful if i eat the second mango i feel wonderful i have a stamina to eat at least 5 6 mangoes so i'll feel good until i'm full after that what the mango that was giving me joy when i was hungry is now a burden i'll say no no this is it i don't want it anymore so the same activity the same pravrutti that was making me happy making me joyful is now making me miserable so is the joy in pravrutti is the joy in that mango we mistake that the joy we get when we engage in this world through our sense organs so when the sense organ and the sense object come together joy will happen we think we misunderstand that the joy is happening because of that thing it's not true the joy happens because the desire for that thing temporarily goes away from our mind so desire fulfillment and desire elimination happen at the same time happiness happens joy happens not because of desire fulfillment happiness happens because of desire elimination this we don't understand so we keep pursuing things we keep pursuing things and we become miserable eventually then patanjali muni says you have tried hmm? everything come back now now I, now i will tell you अथ योगानुशासन अथ मीन्स नाव योग मीन्स यू नो वॉट योग इज राइट वील टॉक अबाउट दैट अनुशासन मीन्स सेल्फ डिसिप्लिन शासन मीन्स डिसिप्लिन अनु मीन्स कंटिन्युअस एंड सेल्फ इम्पोज सी इफ समबडी एल्स इम्पोज इज समथिंग अपॉन अस इट इज कॉल्ड शासन वेन वी इम्पोज दैट शासन ऑन अवर ओन इट इज कॉल्ड अनुशासन सो इट इज सेल्फ डिसिप्लिन self discipline is actually liberating if discipline is imposed by somebody else from outside then it becomes a jail a prison right so when we engage in self discipline yoga is basically a tool by which we discipline our life because only in a disciplined mind can clarity dawn that is the reason see i already told you the punch line i told you the bottom line i told you the conclusion the conclusion is you feel happy because of elimination of desire you don't feel happy because of fulfillment of desire i already told you that but how do you understand this how do you realize that see normally we don't understand this thing as clearly as it should be understood most of the time we think that fulfillment of desire is what i want to do everybody else is doing that i have also done that and yes when desire was fulfilled i was happy so i keep on doing that to get out of this mistaken notion mind has to be disciplined so yoga is chitta vritti nirodha yoga ha chitta vritti nirodha that's the second verse so after you seen the first verse atha yoga anushasanam now come to yoga why chitta vritti nirodha you have to calm your mind down you have to calm the vrittis in the mind down how do you calm the vrittis in the mind down see you are constantly being bombarded by the world you are taking the world in through the five senses so impressions are getting created on the mind all the time vrittis are getting created in the mind all the time how do you stop doing that you can stop doing that by closing everything we do that every night don't we do that the reason we do that every night the reason we go to sleep 
is because during the day we are creating so many vrittis in our mind that our mind gets tired and therefore we want to go to sleep because in sleep the world is not coming at us anymore in yoga we are expected to do this while being fully aware and fully awake that is called samadhi that is called samyama that is what patanjali tells us that you have to calm the vrittis down if you shut your house if you close all the windows sunlight will not enter but will the sun disappear the sun will not disappear you can be in darkness you can close the world you can close the doors so the world will be out and you will not be bothered by it but as soon as you open the doors as soon as the samadhi is broken as soon as you come out of the samadhi then once again mahabharat is that any good no but to discipline our mind yoga anushasana is necessary yoga chitta vritti nirodha why chitta vritti nirodha tada drashtu swarupe avasthanam that is the actual goal of yoga the goal of yoga is to realize who we are in the still mind in the mind which is vritti virahit which is free of vrittis the true self will shine clearly brightly tada drashtu swarupe avasthanam the experiencer will experience himself that's what will happen so that is the goal of yoga the goal of yoga is not twisting your body into impossible shapes if you twist your body into an impossible shape in some baddha padmasan and then you get baddha <laughs> you cannot come out of it then what good is this yoga you know you have to call somebody to do, release you from your baddha konasan or baddha padmasan that is not yoga at all about asana patanjali muni says only a verse and a half is the sthira sukham asanam so in whichever asana your sukha is sthira in whichever pose your joy is steady that is called asana not baddha padmasana baddha padmasana is okay for a different purpose if you can sit steadily if you can be joyful it if you can be at ease in baddha padmasan by all means sit in baddha padmasan no problem but you need to understand how long you are going to stay in that baddha padmasan and when you have to come out so pravrutti and nivrutti both have to be understood okay so sthira sukham asana see i am taking you step by step through eight steps of yoga also while we are talking about it so asana is one step there are eight steps there are eight limbs eight angas of yoga patanjali muni talks about eight different limbs of yoga yama niyama asana pranayama pratyahara dharana dhyana samadhi these are the eight angas right i mean you all know this whole theory why do we need to do all this in today's world i don't really need to explain to you what yoga is the word yoga itself means union the union of what people will say if you are in the path of devotion you will say union of this jiva with ishvara okay if you are in some other philosophy you know you will think of something else it doesn't matter union of the individual with the cosmic individual uh, in the union of the atma with the paramatma you can say whatever number of things you want to say yoga itself will be joyful see even when you put something tasty on your mouth in your mouth on your tongue so when the mango touches the tongue the tongue and the mango are united that's when joy happens joy happens when experiencer and the experience the come together in a pleasurable scenario so when the experience and the experienced come together it may not necessarily be joyful so when you touch something hot you will get burned so when you touch the world 
through these five senses. Matras parashas to kaunte yo, shitoshna sukha dukkada. So it will be either hot or cold and it will be either pleasant or unpleasant. So right now it is summer. So if we touch something cool, it will feel pleasant. But the same cold thing, if we touch during the winter, it will feel bad. So the cold by itself is not good or bad. Depending upon our situation, it becomes good or bad. We have to understand all these things. See, when we understand these fundamental things about our life, our everyday life, we can experience life much better. Our experience of life becomes much, much better. The fundamental principles are understood about who we are, what this world is, what the nature of the world is, who the creator of this world is. Is that God or is that somebody else? How should we live in this world? How should we live in this world? Patanjali Muni has told us very clearly to live in the world properly so that you are not a problem to the world and the world is not a problem to you. Live according to five principles of Yama. Ahimsa, Satya, Asteya, Brahmacharya, Aparigraha. These are the five fundamental don'ts. Don't tell a lie. Don't steal. Don't hurt anybody. Okay? Stay away from overindulgence in sense objects. And don't unnecessarily hoard things. Don't collect things. Because the more things we collect, the more bonds we create. You know, when I say that this is my phone, I have a bond between me and my phone. The more such bonds I have, the more bound I am. And I get stuck. So to remain safe in this world and to make sure that the world is safe from me, I have to live according to the Yama. First principle. Second principle is Niyama. Niyama means I have to have some self-discipline in my life. So I am not a problem to myself. So, I myself am my best friend and I myself am my worst enemy. The way I conduct myself. How do I conduct myself? Shaucha, cleanliness, santosha, contentment, swadhyaya, study of the self, which is what we are doing right now. Ishvara Pranidhana. Ishwara Pranidhana is surrender to God's will is how it will be translated normally. The way I would say is you realize, understand, learn what nature's laws are, how this whole thing is working and be in sync with those laws. Why? Because if you are not in sync, then you will be blown away. Then your experience of life will not be good. But if you are in sync with the cycles of nature, you will enjoy life. Ishvara Pranidhana. And Tapa. Tapa means literally to heat yourself. Tapa also means 12 years. So if you do any kind of sadhana for 12 years, you will become a tapasvi. You will become really expert at something, anything. So that's why we go to school for 12 years. Then if you want to become really expert at something, you have to go to school another 12 years. Oh my God. Yeah, that ha that's what happens. So when you study something for 12 years, then you will become really good at it. Tapa. So yama, niyama. When we live like this, then asana will happen automatically. Is what I have experienced in my life. If we just do the asana and forget about the yama, niyama, you know, you can do gymnastics, but you will not become a yogi. So asanas are not gymnastics. Yoga is not merely asanas. Yoga is an entire lifestyle, Ashtanga Yoga. So yama, Niyama, Asana. Then Pranayama. Pranayama means not breathing in and out. Prana means the energy body. The energy is within our body. When they are in balance. That is called pranayam. If our mind is steady, if we have observed yama niyama properly, if we do the asanas regularly, and when we are in a sthirasokam asanam, then pranayama will not need to be done. It will happen. Your energies will be in balance. So your body will function very nicely. The body will be held up by the prana very nicely. 
pranayama then the fifth one is pratyahara pratyahara is anti ahara what we are used to is ahar 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 all the time anedo 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 no we consume all the time because we are thinking that by consuming we'll be happy patanjali muni tells you that pratyahar will actually make you happy pratyahar in one word is the essence of the first verse of ishavasya upanishad ishavasyam idam sarvam yatkincha jagatyam jagat tena tyaktena bhunjita ma agradakasya svidanam right this whole universe is pervaded by the divine ishavasyam idam sarvam everything is pervaded by the divine yatkincha jagatyam jagat even the smallest thing in the world is pervaded by the divine tena tyaktena bhunjita so you should enjoy it by renunciation not through consumption magrudak kasya svitanam don't covet something that belongs to another like a vulture grudha means vulture giddha don't covet anything that belongs to anybody else and what belongs to us honestly nothing we haven't created anything in this world so nothing belongs to us but whatever we need to sustain our life we should obtain it we should earn it in a proper manner in a dharmic way okay so we should try to pursue things we should try to pursue our goals try to collect things or try to gather things or try to earn things by living righteously living in a manner that doesn't interfere with other people's pursuit of their goals that is called dharma so if we live like this then we are entitled to have certain things but what yoga will suggest to you or what gita will suggest to you that okay you earn a lot of money but don't be attached to it don't over consume even if you have a lot so you may earn a lot a lot of money you may have you may have a big house you may have a lot of food but consume from that only what you truly need and don't be attached to it that is called magrudak asya svidanam pratyahar so enjoy life but without being involved with it but without being attached to it without getting asakta in it that is called pratyahar then thereafter the three angas are all internal dharana dhyan samadhi dharana means we fix our mind in one place in desha dhyana means we fix our mind on one object vastu and thirdly we fix our mind for a long time in kala so desha kala vastu when our mind is fixed on it for a long time that is called samadhi so in yoga some yoga teachers will tell you that you should do tratak so you should look at a flame just constantly while you are watching it then you know you won't watch anything else or you won't see see anything else but your eyes will get tired so then you have to close your eyes right so whatever you do for some time and then after that time it comes to an end that will not give you permanent joy all these eight angas of yoga are to be practiced to discipline our mind in that steady mind who we are will get manifested so who are we let's think about that after having done all this practice think about who we are okay i told you how we experience the world we experience the world as its images in our mind when the mind is steady then that image will not create an impression that image will be created it will go away okay when our mind is steady we will understand that these images are created and they go away they don't last in that clear mind we will realize that whatever has happened in the past is only a memory whatever i have told you so far in the past several minutes maybe half an hour or more where is it right now it's a memory 
if last night you had a dream if you remember your dream how do you remember it now it's a memory what is the difference between the memory of my waking experience a minute ago and the memory of my dream last night both are memories at this time what does this mean this means that the waking experience is also like a dream jagruta avastha swapnavat hi hai jagruta avastha is also like a dream in our clear mind when we understand that the waking experience is like a dream that's when we are truly awake tada drashtu swarupya avastha no we have to reach that stage once we reach that stage then we will do what we need to do in the waking experience without being attached to it without being attached to the results of our action karmani eva adhikar aste ma phaleshu kadachana ma karma phal hetur bhu mate sangosth karmani that shlok of the gita will become manifest in our life whatever we do we will do as an offering to the lord yat karoshi yadashnasi yajjuhosi dadasi yat yat tapasya sikamte ya tat krushva madarpan that's what will happen okay and we will realize our own true self the last verse of the 15th chapter igoyatamam shastram idamuktam maya nag etat budhva buddhiman syat krutya krutyascha bharata when we realize who we are when we are truly awake to our own true self krutya krutyascha bharata whatever needs to be done has been done complete fulfillment has happened such fulfillment will happen to each one of us while we are still in this body before we leave this body is my wish and prayer i wish you a wonderful international yoga day 2022 which will happen on the 21st we are doing it in advance in the us because we try to do everything on the weekends enjoy this entire weekend remain in this thought and be happy thank you Milind, we will now ask people if they want to ask any questions. That will be great. So, if you wish to ask a question, you can unmute yourself one by one, ask your question, and then we'll try to clarify any doubts you may have. So, any questions, comments, suggestions, complaints? Something you did not understand? Yeah. This doesn't make sense at all. Absolutely. <laughs> Please. The concept of pratyahar was not very clear to me. Uh, I thought it was uh, to avoid any undesirable thoughts in your mind. You call, uh, produce a counter thought, you know, sort of. That is what I read somewhere, but it was not clear to me. No problem. So, pratyahar really means prati ahar. If you look at just the word pratyahar, ahar means to consume, and prati ahar means to not consume. literally it means like that okay so how do we consume we consume things through our senses and we also consume things directly into our mind thoughts what you say is correct so what kind of thoughts do we entertain see thoughts will come in the mind about that there is no doubt if your eyes are open you will see things there is no problem with that eyes are meant to see in the same way mind is meant to think thoughts will come into the mind but which thoughts you should entertain and which thoughts you should not entertain that is up to you just the way what food should i eat and what food should i not eat that is up to me karmani eva adhikar aste ma phaleshu kadachana but once you entertain a certain thought then it will create a chain of thoughts right what happens is fundamentally whenever we think of anything that thing is apart from ourselves we can only think of something other than ourselves we can only think of what we call in sanskrit anatma i the atma is thinking of something else the anatma so thoughts will always be of the other okay analyze this a bit carefully 
how does this other enter my mind? It enters as a vritti. It enters as a sensation. It doesn't enter as it is. So if I'm thinking of you, you don't enter my head as it is. Your thought enters my head. Okay. So this whole world enters our mind as sensations, either through our physical sense organs or directly as thoughts in our mind. Which thoughts we should entertain and which thoughts we should not entertain. If we entertain only the proper thoughts, the good thoughts, the thoughts that take us towards our own true self. If we entertain those, what are those uh, thoughts? Those are, that is called Swadhyaya. So when we contemplate on who we are, when I contemplate on who I am, who I really am, only that thought process will liberate me. Every other thought process, how can I get this? How can I get rid of this? Those thought processes or those thoughts will bind me in the world. That's what will happen. So entertaining only good thoughts, keeping bad thoughts away is called pratyahar of the mind. But how do we get there? We get there by controlling our tongue. That's what I have experienced in my own experience. In fact, that's what we do as a part of our Satpa program where Prakash Dada, you're already there as a part of the program. So you will also experience this, that once we have some control over our tongue, then our body becomes detoxified, number one. Our mind becomes clear and we realize from within which thoughts to entertain and which thoughts not to entertain. That way Pratyahar will start happening. So initially Pratyahar we will do on the actual ahar, on the actual food. We will only consume what is good for us. We will only consume when necessary and we will consume only as much as necessary. If we inculcate that one discipline in our life, what is the bottom line? I will not eat until I am hungry. If we can maintain this one fundamental discipline in life, then many other things start becoming very clear to us. So, Pratyahar is that. We have actually done two different programs on Pratyahar. So, you can go back or I will send you a link to the Pratyahar programs. If you just search Pratyahara and my name on YouTube, you should be able to get those two recordings. In great detail, we have talked about Pratyahar. What is Pratyahar? Okay. Two sessions of two hours each. So four hours of contemplation on Pratyahara itself. <clears throat> so today I have done this contemplation of yoga, the entire thing within maybe half an hour to 45 minutes. You can't really do justice to each one of these things in such a short time. But today we are only doing an overview. And hopefully this will encourage you to think further, think more deeply and try to get into it. So Nainatai has asked me the question, somebody with osteoarthritis, can they do yoga? They may not be able to do yoga, Sana, but they will be able to do yoga the way I have explained. Yoga is not just asanas. Yoga is a lifestyle. Yoga is a thought process. Yoga is stilling the mind. Twisting of the body is not yoga. Yoga is straightening the mind. That is what yoga means. So yes, of course, anybody and everybody can do yoga. Yoga is an understanding. Yoga is not asanas. If you limit yourself to asana, then the person with osteoarthritis may not be do, able to do all the asanas. For them, there will be special asanas and you can learn from a yogacharya. We have a yogacharya who can teach you. You can talk to me separately about that and we can do it. No problem. Any other questions or comments? You can... Yeah. Uh -huh. Carrying on the extension of Pratyahara, then sorry to take your time. No problem. Uh, as Swami Anubhananda said, I think just as you eat only when necessary, one can also extrapolate and say, think only when necessary. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. See, what does that mean? Good. I'll tell you how to do that. I mean, Prakash Dada, I think that's a great point. I'm so delighted you asked me that because, see, first of all, Swami Anubhananda, I consider to be my guru. Swamiji does not consider anybody to be his disciple. Because he tells us very clearly, and I agree with him. See, I told you in the conventional sense that Swamiji is my guru. Okay, But he will tell you that 
and i agree i will tell you the same thing that the desire to learn in our heart is our guru and to teach us what we need to learn if some person appears then we will call him our guru so the really rich person has many gurus because every experience is a guru if we learn from every experience in our life then the guru principle has awakened in our heart that is what the guru means all right so swami ji says that if you want to really learn something that itself is enough i am not your guru the desire in your heart to learn is your guru and i am just a manifestation of that desire so don't take me seriously so milin has said that gurudev dutt had 24 gurus right we can have infinite gurus because we have infinite experiences so from each experience if we learn then every experience of our life is guru so that's why what is our prayer gurur brahma gurur vishnu gurur devo maheshwara guru sakshat para brahma tasmay shri gurave namaha right guru sakshat para brahma para brahma means what infinity the guru principle is infinite the guru principle is not limited to one person one body so whatever experience we use for our own learning and our own progress is our guru so therefore thoughts will come in the mind i told you that thoughts are always of the other but is there an other think of that you see in the 15th chapter in the 16th verse bhagwan says द्वाविमौ पुरुषो लोके क्षरश्चाक्षर एव च क्षरस्सर्वाणि भूतानि कोटस्थो क्षर उच्यते देयर इज एन इल्यूजन ऑफ द एक्सपीरियन्सर एंड द एक्सपीरियन्सड व्हेन वी आर वेक व्हेन वी आर इन द वेकिंग एक्सपीरियन्स सो व्हाइल वी आर अवेक देयर इज एन एक्सपीरियन्स ऑफ मी एक्सपीरियन्सिंग यू मी एक्सपीरियन्सिंग द वर्ल्ड that is an experience so there is an experiencer and there is an experience the world so this experiencer is called the akshara purush and the experienced the world is called the kshara purush so there are two purushas one is akshara and one is kshara in sankhya terms we will call purusha and prakriti so prakriti is constantly changing purusha is the same isn't it so that is the akshara kshara sarvani bhutani all these bhutas all these transient beings are kshara kutastho akshara uchyate kutastha akshara uchyate kutastha means me so somebody in bhakti marg will tell you that all our all of us transient jeevas mamai vansho jeeva loke jeeva bhuta sanatana these are the transient things and akshara is bhagwan parmeshwar ishvara and beyond that what bhagwan says is uttamah purushas tu anya paramatma iti udharata yo lokatraya ma vishya vibharti avyaya ishvaraha so the third principle in which these two things are created that is called paramatma iti udharata so the paramatma the ishvara and para brahma they are the same things they are called by these three different names by three different kinds of people so the person who is pursuing yoga he will talk about paramatma paramatma has attributes but no shape so he is sagun nirakar that is paramatma the ishvara is sagun sakar so krishna rama ganapati shiva shankara anybody any ishta devata is sagun sakar that is the bhagwan of the person who is into bhakti that is bhagwan ishvara sagun sakar nirgun a saguna nirakar is paramatma and nirguna nirakar is brahma that is purusha purushottama uttama purushastu anya paramatma iti udharata yo loka trema visha vibharti avyaya ishvara so people will call him ishvara or paramatma yasmat ksharam atitoham it's beyond the kshara aksharad api cha uttama it's beyond the akshara better than the akshara 
Atosmi loke vedecha pratita purushottama. That is called purushottama. Not just the purusha of the sankhya. Purushottama. Yomam evam asamudaha janati purushottamam sa sarva vid bhajati maam sarva bhavena bharatam. So to this purushottama, we bow down. Then Bhagavan concludes. Iti guhyatamam shastram idam uktam mayanaga etad budhmat buddhiman syat krita krutyasya bharata. If we understand these things, if we understand these things properly, then we will be krita krutya. Krita krutya means I have done whatever I needed to do. I have understood who I am. I have reached the final goal. But the person who has reached the final goal will never say so in those many words. Because if I say the sentence, I have realized myself, what will that mean? This I is still there, no? So, Aham Brahmasmi is an experience within. It is not something to be verbally said. No. Aham Brahmasmi is an experience. What can be said? What should be said? What is accurate? Tattva Masi. You are that. You are that reality. That can be said. That should be said. So, I should say that you all are that supreme reality. You all are divine. In fact, we are all divine. We don't realize that. Whether we know it or not, whether we believe it or not, whether we like it or not, we are divine. We are all divine because the whole existence, whole creation is pervaded by the divine. Isha Vasya Vidam Sarvam. So am I not included in that? I am also a part of that. Mama Ivansho Jiva Loke Jiva Bhutas Sanatanam. So we are all. So from physical point of view, from the body's point of view, in the physical reality, while we are in the physical form, when we are identified with the physical form, we need a Sagun Sakar Ishvara, Rama, Krishna, some temple, some place where we can go and bow down. Okay. But when we think of ourselves as the Jiva, as an individual entity, then we, need, we think of this entity as a part of the Supreme Ishvara. Mama Yvansho Jiva Loke. So the first thing is Shuddha Dvaita, where I and God are totally separate. And I have to worship God, I have to serve Him, I have to love Him, all those things we have to do. That is Dvaita. Second thing, I am a part of that supreme reality. I am Amsha. That is Vishishta Dvaita. Okay. And thirdly, I and the Father are one. See, Jesus Christ did the same thing. Initially, He said, I am the Son of Man. Then he said, I am the son of God. And then he said, I and the father are one. So he went from Dvaita to Vishishta Advaita to Advaita. From Madhvacharya to Ramanujacharya to Shankaracharya. So these are based on our own state of mind. Whether we will be in Dvaita, whether we will be in worship, whether we will be in Seva, whether we will be in Karma, whether we will be in Upasana, whether we will be doing Yoga, Ashtanga Yoga, Asana and all those things. This is all until we consider ourselves to be an individual apart from the other. Then once we realize that we are a part of that divine, we will become completely devoted, surrendered to it and our mind will become focused. So we do karma yoga with our body to clarify our mind. Then we do yoga to discipline our life. Then we do upasana to make our mind single pointed towards our deity. And then in that purified, single pointed, disciplined mind, the jigyasa or the desire to know who am I? Who is this deity? will will arise. Then we'll go on the path of jnana, the last phase of our life. Once we understand all these things properly, then Krita Krita Bharata. Thereafter, you will keep on doing what needs to be done. It's not that you will stop doing. You will keep on eating, you will keep on sleeping, you will keep on doing whatever you do in the world. 
but you will do that with extreme clarity. We will do that without any expectation in return. We will do that to express joy rather than to try to find joy through what we do. That's what will happen. So glad you asked me this question. There was one other question here. Uh, let me go into the chat. Ah, what is your opinion regarding veganism? You see, in today's world, it is better to be a vegan than to be a vegetarian or a non-vegetarian. I'll tell you why. Because when food comes directly from the earth, it is as pure as it can be without any processing, if it is ready to eat, what is ready to eat that comes from the earth that is palatable and that is easily digestible? Fruits and some nuts or seeds. That's the best thing to eat. So I will go one step beyond veganism. I will go to raw veganism. Okay. So if you want to really be completely healthy, happy, in today's world. It is better to consume food without processing to the extent you are hungry, when you are hungry, to the extent you can digest. How will I come to know this? I will come to know this because I'll feel hungry again. So if I have overeaten, then it will take me longer to digest my food. If I eat only when I'm hungry, whatever I eat, I will digest. Whether I eat vegan food, raw vegan food, non-vegetarian food, I will digest. About that, there is no doubt. What to eat, what not to eat is in our hands. But after it goes in, whether to digest or throw it up or throw it the other way, that is decided by the laws of nature. That is not in our hands. Food has to be eaten like medicine. In the 13th verse, in the 15th chapter, Bhagavan says, so I give life to Aushadi which sustains you. Aushadi means food. I sustain life through food which you eat. That's what happens. So if we treat food as our medicine, then we will never get sick. In the very next verse, Bhagavan says, Aham vaishvanaro bhutva praninam deham ashritaha pranapana samayuktaha pacham yannam chaturvidham So whatever we eat, thereafter, the vaishvanara or the digestive fire in our belly is what is digesting it. We are not digesting it. That digestive fire has to be kept on at all times. How do we keep it on? By making sure that we don't douse it by food and drink. That is the yajna. You know, in Marathi, we say, Udarabharana nohe janije yajna karma. So, Udarabharana means eating food is not for sense pleasure. It is a yajna karma. It is an offering into the sacrificial fire, yajna. Which sacrificial fire? Vaishwanar. Jatharagni. Into that Jatharagni, if we only add the proper kind of fuel, the proper quantity of fuel, then that Jatharagni will always remain pradipta or it will remain active. The day that Jatharagni becomes Manda, or if you douse it by overeating, then what will happen? You will eventually die. You can, in fact, we die because of overeating. These days, in today's world, there are problems because of overnourishment, not because of undernourishment. Luckily, there used to be. I mean, now we have seen we have more food then twice the number of people can be fed. So we have, what, seven and a half billion people, but we have produced food for 15 billion people. 
that's how much food we produced last year our production of food i'm not saying last year i mean in the in the recent past we haven't really had food shortages food shortages are created because of lack of transportation or conflict or things like that food shortages are not because there isn't enough food there is enough food there is food security around the world right now no problem with that but we don't know how much to consume how to consume when to consume this we don't know if we understand these things then we live properly we do give this guidance through the satva program by the way so if you are interested to learn about satva by all means talk to me separately and i'll tell you more about it it's a lot of fun by the way most of the people who have joined the program and who have been a part of the program they have loved it great any other questions comments it's been a pleasure talking to all of you so if there are no further questions i wish you all well have a wonderful weekend have happy fathers day weekend enjoy the international day of yoga keep on practicing yoga bring that into your life become a yogi before you leave this world thank you very much milind for inviting me to this talk and pleasure meeting all of you have a wonderful day ahead bye bye